Uh, good morning. Uh, so thanks again for the, the opportunity to uh, talk about this. It's something we've been working on in, in the IETF and elsewhere. Um, there's a bunch of other IETF people around here. Pete Resnick and Kathleen Moriarty. I see their other IETF area directors. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can grab them or me. And I think there's a couple of others around uh, later on if you can chat about it. So the topic here is um, pervasive monitoring. And you know, we've seen a whole bunch of kind of revelations in the last uh, almost year now. Uh, the photograph is of a, uh, a national park in, in Wales in the UK called Snowdonia, uh, which is kind of where we've been living since this all, all has, uh, has started to happen. The, the summary of this talk basically is all on this slide. Uh, so what's been kind of revealed is uh, essentially that the actions of uh, NSA and their partners, and you know, there's a bunch of countries involved, um, and with some of the partners, whether they're coerced or whether they're, they're collaborating, uh, it's a multifaceted form of attack. On, on the internet, essentially. Or if, even if you think their motiva motivations are justified, it's indistinguishable from such an attack. So basically, as such, um, we need to treat it that way. Uh, and I think that's, the, that's the, the big discussion we had in the IETF uh, over the last, you know, I don't know, I guess over the last six months or so. Um, and I'll, I'll describe the conclusion the IETF arrived at. Um, it's not unique that those countries are doing it. What's reported is probably being done by other people. Um, nation state actors, the, in the na inevitable nature of the technology is that what, what only the largest governments can do today, other governments can do later, and then eventually everybody can do it. And that, that, that kind of gets a bit scary if that becomes true. So we should work against it. Technically, um, the scale is probably the most interesting thing about this. We don't really see very many new technical uh, attack me mechanisms being used, but the ones we've known about. Uh, I think it is fair to say that there's um, the scale and the kind of, we haven't necessarily uh, dealt as well with the possibility of combining different attacks in how we've designed protocols and how we've made them such that the likes of folks here can deploy them uh, easily with the security features turned on. So we'll talk a little more about that. And then also I think it's important to note that um, from the IETF perspective or from the perspective of uh, the technical community or the broader internet community, we, it's not a problem we can solve. I mean, this is a problem that's related to government policy and public policy in various ways. Um, so we're not going to be able to solve the problem. But given that it's, it's indistinguishable from other types of attack and involves specific types of attack, we need to mitigate it. And then if society decides that they want to kind of use those mitigations and, and do something else, we should have the tools in place that allow them to do what they need to do. So the contents of this are basically just some discussion of what's, you know, what is pervasive monitoring. Uh, some, uh, you know, something about um, you know, having been caught at doing it and then what to do. If you're bored by this particular talk and prefer a video, the, um, at the IETF meeting in Vancouver last November we had a, a technical plenary session about this, which has some talking, but it, has, like, it had literally hundreds of people um, who contributed at the microphones. And, and actually that was probably the most interesting part of the discussion. Um, so if you have two and a half hours to, to spend and, and you're interested in this topic that much, then go and look at that video. Uh, and then just a disclaimer that this talk is mostly about what I think on the topic. There's a few places where the IETF has reached consensus, and I'll try and point those out, but mostly you're just hearing what I think and not what, what has full IETF consensus. So we have a definition. Um, this is in an internet draft, which will become an RFC, hopefully in the next week or so, uh, for what pervasive monitoring is. Um, and I guess you, know, you can read that, but the, you know, the key things I think are that it's not necessarily new, but it's, it's indiscriminate, it's very large scale. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't really adhere to the classic kind of security thing that we've thought about a lot, which is this an active or a passive attack. It tends to involve kind of mixtures of both. Um, so just repeating that a bit, and so the aspects of it's not targeted. You're, you know, the, the attacker is attempting to catch all traffic or all users in some geography or for some application or protocol. Um, and it's different from targeted monitoring. So, I think while we have some consensus in the IETF about pervasive monitoring, uh, we have a different set of consensus discussions uh, 14 years ago about targeted monitoring or wiretapping as, as, it's, as, it's, as it's known. And you can see RFC 2804 for where that discussion landed. Uh, but these are different things. Uh, and diff so there are some different parts of the argument to apply. I think the point I mentioned earlier is pervasive monitoring is not really a class of active or passive attack. In the security community, we've probably, I think, failed a little bit in that we've tended to say, we'll analyze this protocol to see if it's, if it's okay for passive attacks or, or we'll do that job for active attacks. And we haven't really considered that you can combine these things and in a system there's a whole bunch of protocols that you might be able to use. So for example, you might by, uh, um, by monitoring you know, HTTP 
uh, queries that are you know, on a page but are not the kind of main meat of the page, you might be able to use that um, to, to then det you know, determine what target to use for a, passive, for a passive attack later. Or the other way around, in fact. So there's one case where it's been reported that um, they, they were monitoring SSH sessions. And, and in order to decide who to do an active attack on later, they would determine an SSH session was an administrator by the fact that it essentially wasn't just a fake login attempt, so that there were, there were some longer packets being exchanged than, than you would see in that profile. So they were using a passive attack to say, this looks like an, an active SSH thing an admin would do, therefore we might attack that person. So it's a mixture. And then just as a terminology thing, we refer to it as an attack. That's a kind of, a, you know, just a, 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 for brevity. But it really involves a whole kind of slew of different kind of uh, techniques uh, used in a coordinated manner and at scale. So just looking through some of the things that have been reported, I'm not going to try and do an exhaustive timeline because there's been so much. Um, um, but th th it's interesting to kind of pull out a, a, some kind of analysis of this. There was also at, in the, at the November IETF, Dave Taylor from Microsoft did an interesting analysis uh, on, along different dimensions where he tried to kind of do uh, a matrix where the rows were things you could attack and the columns were things that have been reported. And the matrix is almost full. Um, but in this case, we look at it in kind of more like a layered way. We need to be careful, you know, just be, be cognizant though. We don't know exactly what's been done. A lot of the media reporting doesn't give you sufficient detail to know. So there's some extrapolation, there's some guessing, there's some speculation, there's some people with tinfoil hats who are um, paranoid about everything and so on. So you need to take some of this with a pinch of salt. But the overall, I think, is pretty clear. And there is, on Wikipedia, there's a timeline which is not too bad that kind of goes through this month by month, uh, which is another view of it that's useful. So if we start from a kind of a, the lowest layers, you probably won't be able to read these slides, but I'll just be picking out a couple of topics off each. And I don't know if you make the slides available somewhere, probably, or great. Um, so at the lowest level, um, uh, we look at the second one there. It's kind of a well-known thing that there's a random number generator that was part of a NIST standard um, using elliptic curve cryptography. And it seems like that this, this particular random number generator, at least in principle, could have been backdoored by the, the people who developed it. We don't know for sure if it was or not. We do know for sure that it could have been. And that's really not a good characteristic of a cryptographic function, to have something that you know could have been backdoored. Um, so that was kind of pretty controversial. It's led to, um, for example, I think NIST are trying to kind of recover and, and look at their processes as to how they develop these things in future. Um, I think there will be some improvements in those processes. We'll see uh, to what extent people become happier with those over time. Um, so there's basically these low-level attacks. So this is looking at the, a random number generator that's used um, way below your application, maybe even in hardware. The first one is actually a theoretical interesting paper, an academic paper that speculates that the random number generator that's built into the Intel processors um, could be essentially backdoored or you could reduce the, the, the output um, size if you're able to modify the, the doping of the silicon during manufacture, so not during design, but during manufacture of the silicon as it goes around the world to the various uh, fabs and so on, uh, which is an interesting theoretical um, exercise. And it shows you the level of, the low level to which some of these attacks kind of involve. So moving up a little bit more, uh, I'll just call out, the, I guess, that there's a bunch of these, some of the, these have become buzzwords. Tempora, I think, is one of the interesting ones. Uh, basically, this seems to be a program where the UK government um, we're tapping fibers, uh, transatlantic fibers, as they landed, um, and keeping a significant amount of this traffic. And I think that one is important because that means that for a lot of traffic, if we're sending it in clear, we know there's a really high probability that yes, it is being recorded. So this is not theoretical. And I think the difference between um, two years ago when there were a bunch of people in the security communities would worry about this kind of thing, uh, and now when we know it's happening, is, is quite significant. A lot of people are willing to actually do work to try and mitigate things, and they know for sure it's happening. And it is happening for sure. Um, at this level, they're, they're, they're grabbing packets, and they're, they're recording them for days or months or something. Um, but then you have a whole bunch of other cases, where, you know, more or less looking at, at recording application things, to, to financial records, phone records, email, and so on. Going up again, higher a little bit in the stack. Um, we've seen some cases reported of man-in-the-middle attacks on popular websites, and this is either using kind of weaknesses in the web public key infrastructure that you know, people click on stuff without uh, paying attention, or using other more subtle weaknesses, or perhaps even having colluding certification authorities, um, or certification authorities who've been hacked into. Who knows? But 
we have seen some reports of those kind of attacks um, where we need to, to really think about it deep, deeply. And then it gets down to the ridiculous. So the, the very last one here is a case where the UK uh, signals agency was looking at Yahoo video. And I really like the last line was that they were, you know, their, their, their staff um, had to get uh, some counseling because a surprising number of people were using webcam conversations to show intimate parts of their body. Uh, so it's really you know, very important anti-terrorism stuff. Um, going up a level, there's, you know, there are some places in the world um, where there's some legal compulsion, um, where basically you, you, know, you have to, um, you, know, you might be given, I think in the US they're called national security letters or something, where you basically are told you must start doing this. Uh, and there is some pushback starting. The, the link here is about the pushback from uh, various companies who are saying, <coughs> we want to be doing these reports about transparency, saying how many of what type of requests we're getting. I think that's, a, that's kind of a good, a good thing to counter what seems to be a, a kind of pretty kind of murky thing of uh, certainly in secret being told you have to kind of give away um, user information and records and so on without necessarily having something like a court order or so on. Uh, and then again, we can kind of think, not all of this is nation state. Um, some people, I'm not saying I, I buy into it, but there are some people in the world who would think that corporates are also actually doing some of the, a lot of these kind of things and, and are just happy to collude because they can make more profit. So there is that opinion in the world. I'm not saying I agree with it. And then again, up, up another little bit of a level, there is some damage to the kind of reputation of the internet and people developing, working on the internet and so on out of this because, you know, for end users, they're, they're just going to think, oh, I'm being, everything I do is being recorded by governments, maybe by large corporates and so on. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's a bad thing. That's something we kind of want to work to, I think, together um, to try and mitigate by doing better, uh, mostly. There's damage to, to the various co uh, governments and their partners, uh, and also to other entities that are capable of this kind of attack. Because I think what this shows is that if uh, you have to think in terms of uh, the capability of the possible opponent, and not necessarily their, their, their public statements or, or goodwill, um, it's the, when you're dealing with uh, a possible opponent, it's their capability that counts. So anybody who has these kind of capabilities has to some extent been damaged by the fact that we know a whole bunch of people are actually doing this for real. And also, uh, you know, this is not, not likely to stop. Um, others will probably join in. Uh, you know, it's now that, now that uh, you know, some of the mechanisms, some of the things people are doing um, have been exposed, there are undoubtedly signals intelligence agencies in other countries saying, oh yeah, we forgot to do that, let's start now. Um, so we have to keep working at it. Uh, there's also been damage to kind of the internet community's processes. There's one particular part of the, um, the revelations that dealt with a thing called Bull Run, which basically involves spending uh, 250 million US dollars a year, apparently, to make internet security worse, deliberately. And, and there is a lot of people who think that, yeah, that might mean that some of the people taking part in our processes are actually being paid indirectly or directly, but probably more likely indirectly, in order to make internet security worse. It creates a lot of doubt. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we should deal with that. Um, and also, of course, if those, for those of you who love internet governance, um, and I'm sure there are some here, this, all the, these events have basically given everybody another thing to throw on the pile of arguments to make um, pro or con, whatever your argument is. Um, but I think getting caught was, has really been kind of bad for this thing. I mean, if you were going to do this, this kind of monitoring, letting the fact that you're doing it leak out is just tremendously bad. You know, it clearly shows that you're not capable of doing that kind of stuff, and you should not have started doing it in the first place. Uh, also, there's a kind of an issue that a lot of the agencies that are doing this, so in the UK and US certainly, uh, are government agencies who are also supposedly responsible for advising government, industry and others on how to make the internet more secure because they do have a lot of expertise. Um, so I think the, um, the information assurance sides of those, those organizations has been tremendously damaged uh, by, by what they've been caught doing. Um, and I think it seems, you know, you'd, you'd be surprised, well, they may or may not restructure some of these things, but it would seem to make some sense if they want people to, be, to have some belief in the kind of cyber security advice or whatever you want to call it that you're getting from these agencies, uh, that they would then say, you know, we're not at the same time spending a quarter of a billion dollars a year to try and attack you. Um, so just a couple of reasons, that, a couple of the arguments that kind of came up during the, the, the big debate on the IETF, um, some of which are, are, are actually valid and, and pose interesting challenges for us, other of which are bogus. So those arguing to say that things are good, uh, I think the first point is, is, does actually have some merit, is that you know, if, if you're saying that pervasive monitoring is just bad and should not be done, uh, how do I ever start doing targeted monitoring for those people who think that's also a good thing? 
I mean, how do I find the people to target? Um, and I, there, is, there are some real technical challenges there, and, and I don't think we necessarily have good answers to that, but uh, it's something to be, to, be, to be discussed and something to be thought about. Uh, the next one is, is uh, one of the bogus arguments, I think, is to say it's all terrorism and trying to scare people. There are a bunch of people for whom emotional reactions are generated by this discussion. Um, and I think you, know, you have to deal with that. It's a real thing that they really think that because of some event or because of uh, terrorism being scary that they should, that government should be doing this kind of thing. Um, so I think we have to deal with that argument because um, it's real. I, I don't think it's, you know, it's real that they feel that, but I don't think it's a, it gives us any clue as to what to do technically. The argument that the public don't want any of this, they don't care, they're all busy posting pictures of kittens on Facebook, um, is also has some slight merit, but nonetheless, I think you know, we should, as a technical community, be putting in place the technologies that allow for a better educated public, or for those of the public who do care, to, to get what they want from the internet, which is not to have everything recorded. Um, an argument was raised that for all telecommunications back to telegraphy, to telegraph traffic, that this has always been the case and we should just suck it up and live with it. I don't think it's a good argument as to what we should, should do now. The most bogus argument of all, of course, is one that we've heard governments making numerous times, which is that, you know, oh, we're not actually looking. You know, I'm just kind of closing my eyes and recording everything. Um, and it doesn't matter because I didn't look at the details. And that's utterly bogus. And then the last one is also a, 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 an argument that has real technical kind of import, is that um, network administrators do sometimes need to see what's going on in the network. And there's a definite uh, tension there, which is recognized in the, in the discussion and the consensus in the IETF. There's a real tension there between what you, you want to be able to do is essentially to maybe encrypt everything and hide all the identities, uh, but also at the same time you want to manage the network. Um, so we have to figure out the details of that as we look at different protocols and as we find out how people like yourselves deploy networks with more of the security uh, technologies that we're defining turned on. That's a process it'll, it'll go through some time. There are arguments as to why it's bad, and I, I think it raises of monitoring is bad, clearly. Um, there's technical and non-technical arguments. So the technical arguments, uh, basically the ITF consensus, it, part of, of what I'm describing here was the first bullet, really, which is that it's a technical attack. It's like on the first slide I said, it's indistinguishable from other types of attack. Um, and because it's a technical attack, then we should just do the normal risk analysis figure out what mitigations might make sense to deploy and are feasible and can be managed and so on and so on, and do a good job as we can and put in place those mitigations as we define protocols, as people implement them in open source and in products, and as people deploy them and then operate them, which is, I guess, more of what you're interested in. Another reason it's bad, and I guess it's going beyond the IETF consensus, but these are some issues that came up in arguments and in the discussion and elsewhere, is that inherently if you're doing this kind of attack, you will at some point have to uh, do some kind of active attack to get into some box to, to execute your code or something. And it seems that the, way, the only feasible way for the signals intelligence ag agencies to do this is to outsource it to some extent. And what they're doing there is they're creating a market and feeding a market for zero-day attacks, which then will get used anywhere. Right? So it, 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 it doesn't seem that it's actually feasible for these agencies to totally in-house their, de their, their uh, development of new attack tools because the internet is kind of so big, I guess, really, and there's so many different technologies being used. So they are creating this market for zero-day zero attacks as part of, or as a side effect of, their goal of monitoring everything. And, and those weapons are kind of interesting if you think of them as weapons. Uh, they're essentially excellent ways to shoot yourself in the foot, because as soon as you use one of these things for a lot of the cases, you actually uh, essentially hand over the, the blueprints, the design, to how this weapon works to everybody on the internet almost, right? Because um, it, it may leave footprints behind or there may be a patch issue at some point and you can reverse engineer the, the exploit from the patch. So these are the kind of weapons that once you pull them out and use them, you hand over a copy of the weapon to your, to your opponent and to everybody else, good and bad alike. Um, so this, that doesn't seem like a good thing to be spending our time on. Uh, and, and this follows from the fact that I think that the pervasive monitoring does require the bad actor to compromise some running systems. So I don't think it can only be collusive. You can't only be dealing with uh, friendly telcos that used to be part of your national uh, kind of infrastructure. Um, it's, to, to really get broader than that uh, with today's internet, you have to be compromising some running, running systems. Also, if you think about what pervasive monitoring is, I guess from a network management point of view, you guys know an awful lot more than I would. Uh, it essentially involves secretly putting in a major network function without telling anybody and it having no bad effect whatsoever. Uh, and that just seems pretty unlikely to me. That I think, you know, if I'm going to put in a huge new database or a huge new monitoring system in a network, 
and not tell anybody and expect it to have no bad consequences, that seems really unlikely. Also, the data will leak out eventually. You know, we've, we've seen some of, some of these things with the fact that things are leaking out. We've seen lots of data leakage problems with, you know, even in, in, not to do with pervasive monitoring, but to do with things like password databases and other, other records from users. So data will leak out if you start collecting it in this, in this way. And so basically, at some point, if you're arguing for this pervasive monitoring, you essentially would also be arguing that we should hand over all our sensitive data to eventually everybody. Um, and also, I think you, know, you can, you can uh, bring up the old end-to-end -end argument. Um, because the end to end argument is trying to say put, you know, put some intelligence at the edges and so on. And if we required, or if we were required to have this kind of monitoring feature inside the network, which is the only place it can sensibly be, then it, that will constrain how we can innovate. Um, and that, you know, that argument you can spin in lots of ways, and it's, it's, I think it's because it's just true. If, if you have to put this kind of in the network in order to do things, it would basically uh, it mean that you can't be turning on in lots of encryption if, it has to, if this feature has to work. It would mean that you can't be you know, having you know, strong authentication of endpoints, perhaps, because they have to be fakeable by the agencies, and so on and so on. So I think the end-to-end -end argument is, is, is quite a good um, touchstone from which to develop other arguments. There's non-technical arguments um, as well, of course. And, you know, this is way beyond what the ITF would consider, never mind have consensus on, but still worth noting. Uh, I think there's, there's this chilling effects kind of argument that if we know that we're being monitored, it leads to self-censorship. There's quite a good report from Penn, the uh, kind of writer's uh, organization. I think they're based in, in the US, but are worldwide um, so, um, about this, uh, that they've done some surveys of, of writers, so authors of literary works, um, who have found in, a, in that survey, people were more likely to self-censor because they know what's, hap what's being monitored in, in the network. Um, there's a potential for whoever is holding this information to e exercise undue influence. So if you think, let's say, the former East Germany and, and the kind of monitoring that was done there with you know, technology from 40 years ago, um, essentially paper and so on, it, but this is essentially the equivalent of what's being collected now. And if one government in the past has, has demonstrated the capability to, use, to misuse that, to abuse that, it's possible in future. I'm not saying particular governments concerned would be like that, but uh, the possibility might exist. There's a whole bunch of people who argue that privacy is some kind of human right. Now, the details uh, are, are to be done. We haven't uh, figured out all the ramifications of that. How do we really think about it? Uh, but I think there is some merit in the argument that people do have some feeling that they have a right to privacy. Um, I think this, it's, it, you can make an, an argument to say that if people are working on this, if people are developing this technology, deploying this technology, that technology will 100% certainly be used for repression somewhere in the world. I think you know, if we go back and look over uh, what we've seen about how these kind of technologies get used, that seems to be a pretty sound statement to make. So I think we should bear in mind that you know, if people are working on developing these kind of technologies and deploying them specifically intended for this purpose, then yes, that technology, your copy or your product or uh, uh, you know, a ripped version of your product or somebody has, is going to rip your design of your hardware and manufacture it somewhere else, that might end up being used for repression with 100% certainty possibly. Another argument is that sometimes people would argue, say, I have nothing to hide. Well, I don't think that's true at all. I think you can very credibly say that sometimes everybody has something. At some point in time, you have something to hide for every person, you know, from somebody. You know, that we do, I think it's just true to say that. And, and it, that's, a, that's the counter to people saying, I don't have anything to hide. I don't care. That's true for a lot of stuff. But the fact is, it's not true all the time for all people. Um, and then there's, this, there's an assumption behind this pervasive monitoring about guilt by association, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but it's a fallacy. And I think the, the fact that the, the, the monitoring argument is based ultimately on a fallacy tells us a lot. Essentially, it tells us that it's a bad idea for me. Um, and then in the end, I didn't give them permission. I didn't say they could. And that should count for something, right? Um, and that's true, I think, for a lot of the people who use the internet. A lot of the people in the world did not say it's OK to do this. If, if societies wanted to have a discussion, and all came down to decide that in one society we would like to have more monitoring, another one not, then OK. But nobody was asked so far. I think the guilt by association one is interesting to think of um, because there's a lesson for us as to how we react as well. So pervasive monitoring is to some extent motivated by guilt by association. The assumption is if I have somebody who I think might be, let's say, a terrorist or something, um, then the probability that somebody, somebody else they contact is a terrorist is X percent. And for, pick a percentage, and if you actually, some people have run the numbers, and it turns out this is a kind of a pretty dumb approach, but never mind. And this is the kind of assumption. 
And it's, you know, it's, it's essentially saying that if somebody is a suspect and they're in contact with somebody, then the, the second party, party is also becomes a suspect, and maybe the third or fourth to whatever uh, degree of freedom you go. And it's clearly wrong. You know, there, may, there are terrorists in the world, sure. They do talk to each other, generally probably not via open email. Um, but 99% or, or the vast majority of the people they talk to are not terrorists. So this assumption that a suspect uh, talking to an entity makes that second one a suspect is, a, is wrong. It's guilt by association, and it's a fallacy. But we also need to be careful not to fall into that same trap. I mentioned earlier that, this, that Bull Run is spending this uh, huge amount of money per year to, to make internet security worse. And that, that's coming from, for example, NSA. Um, it was from their, I think the report of this was from their budget request um, for, uh, I guess, 2013. Um, so even if some NSA employees are working deliberately, consciously, hard, to subvert the security of the internet, that does not mean that every NSA employee is. Right? So I think the lesson for us is that you know, we can't fall into that same fallacy. If we're against pervasive monitoring because it's based on a fallacy, then we shouldn't fall for the same trick ourselves. And I think what that means is that we should treat, in the technical community, we should treat technical proposals on their merits. We should give them the thorough, rigorous, open examination that we should do to everything. And the fact that something happens to be developed by uh, somebody who works for NIST or NSA or GCHQ or the UK government or a contractor who's worked for somebody or somebody who has research funded um, some years ago shouldn't really matter. Now, we do have new information about the kinds of things that those agencies might be trying, and that information we should consider. So, for example, the possibility that somebody might try to bork a random number generator is not necessarily something we've spent a lot of time thinking about in the past. We should think about that. But the fact that a proposal happens to come from somebody who once worked for, uh, for somebody who was paid by the US Department of Defense, we should avoid that fallacy ourselves and go back to you know, dealing with the technical merits of what we're being presented with in the light of the new information we have. And I, that's an important thing, and it's something that has come up in a, in a bunch of, kind of cases um, with people on mailing lists involved in the internet. OK, so getting on to what might we do about this. Um, just a little bit of IETF history. We've, we've, we've done some of this before. Again, if you go back to the Vancouver IETF plenary presentation, or you can look at the slides or, or the, the, the two and a half hour video, Brian Carpenter made quite a good presentation about this history that in the, in the 1990s we had this kind of crypto wars where various governments, uh, the US mostly, wanted to prevent uh, people on the internet from being able to implement strong cryptography. The IETF considered that. We wrote an RFC, it's called 1984. And basically it says that you should have strong cryptography in internet protocols and in the implementations of that. And, and interesting it says because users uh, need to have privacy is one of the, one of the parts of the argument of it. So you know, going back to, to the 1990s, uh, we have had some similar discussions. Um, you know, we, we thought we were done with it, turns out we weren't. And in, in about 14 years ago we had a, ma a major discussion about targeted uh, monitoring, uh, wiretapping. And Again, the IETF had a big discussion about this. There's a, the mailing list archive is still there if you're, if you're really bored. Um, you can go back and look at it. Um, and it ended up with RFC 2804, which essentially says that the IETF doesn't add wiretap features to our protocols, and it sets out the, the, the good reasons why we don't do that. Um, it's, you know, I won't go into that today. Um, but today's equivalent, I think, is this pervasive monitoring attack. Um, and, and we have to deal with it, and we're, we're, in, we're in the process of doing that. I think we also should recognize, from the IETF perspective, um, and maybe also as a broader technical community, that, that, you know, we're part of the, we are a little bit part of the problem, and, but we're also part of the solution, hopefully. Um, I think from the security uh, community point of view, uh, we have, I think, made it too hard to turn on the security stuff in a useful way for too many protocols and implementations of that. I, mean, I think that's a lesson we need to learn. And I think it is one that is being learned. And certainly in the IETF, I see a lot of signs that people are more willing to do things in a different way that might be more easy to deploy. Um, and you know, I think that's something we have to recognize, that we, we were trying to gold plate the security maybe too much. And we should, need, we should not do that. We should try and make things that are easier for folks like yourselves to deploy, use, and get some security benefit out of that would be a partial mitigation for this uh, attack. So personally, again, this is not an ITF consensus position, but uh, I, I think Bull Run was probably hugely ineffective. It's probably a gigantic waste of government funds, um, but may have had some minor impact. But much more likely than that, if we think along those lines, we have probably also in the security area been a little bit too influenced by the more complex major enterprise requirements um, and have not paid quite enough attention to the requirements of you know, making a, having a simple, easy to use thing that gets you some security. Um, and that, that's inherently, I guess, part of the 
just the history of this technical area is that it was those large enterprises who were the people who were interested enough to get people involved in figuring out solutions. So it's no surprise that the solutions tend to match the requirements from that set of folks. Um, but I think we can, we will do better, and, and we're, we are working on that. So what are we doing? Um, in, in the ITF, basically, we, we started off, we had a side meeting in Berlin in, in July last year um, with a bunch of people about this, and you know, just, this, just the same day that the X key score um, slide deck was published, we had this meeting, so it was timely. We had a bunch, we set up a mailing list, uh, um, it's called a pair pass list, and we had a bunch of discussion on there. We, we teed up the plenary in, in uh, Vancouver in November. It was, the, I think, the best attended um, IETF technical plenary meeting I've, I've been at maybe ever. Um, we had a workshop with the IAB um, and W3C because, you know, again, the IETF alone doesn't kind of work, solve the problem. We've got to work with people like W3C, we've got to work with operators, we've got to work with people implementing and so on to try and figure out the answers. Uh, that workshop was looking at how do we strengthen the internet uh, was the topic. And I guess it goes a little beyond pervasive monitoring because, in fact, if we're, ta if we're trying to mitigate pervasive monitoring, that will lead us to, de to, to try and define, develop, deploy various new security mechanisms, um, whether it's turning on crypto or doing something else. Those have other good benefits beyond just thinking of pervasive monitoring. So I think that, you know, I think that some of the technical what we do so, um, approach doesn't just say we're only thinking about pervasive monitoring. If we have some mechanism that we think might mitigate pervasive monitoring, we're also always going to think about, well, what else could that do that's useful? You know, and is, are there other motivations for doing that? Maybe it'll help with um, you know, just general operation of the internet. It turns out sometimes if you actually run over TLS, you get better performance than if you run in clear. And in, you know, in, some, in some networks, for some cases, that may be true. And that's a reason to turn on security, which is just for, for performance, which is kind of counterintuitive, but turns out sometimes to be the case. Um, we had a bunch of kind of um, boffs and, and other kind of things um, starting at, at ITF 89, which is in London, in, in March. And hopefully, I think we'd want to start seeing some results starting to pop out um, from now, from, from July. Um, and unsurprisingly, this is similar. I mean, there's, there's broader technical community reaction. You've seen a whole bunch of people turning on um, more TLS. For, for example, I think for, um, there, there's a, quite an interesting improvement. I haven't seen figures I can report, but I have had some mail from people saying that. Uh, email between MTAs, so MTA to MTA encryption of email is actually dr fairly dramatically increasing and has almost entirely switched from using RSA key transport, which doesn't give you forward secrecy, to now using uh, for cipher suites that do give you forward secrecy. So there is real movement. I don't think it has been reported or, or measured so much so far, but it's really happening. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of people encrypting stuff to and between the data centers and so on. So this is part of a broader kind of uh, thing. But we have some new work. So we formed a working group um, called UTA, for, which is aimed at uh, using TLS in applications. Uh, and the idea there was to update the BCP's best current practices on how do you use TLS in various contexts. Because what's happened is a lot of these applications have been developed over the last decade, decade and a half. And when this particular protocol was standardized, that was the, the TLS cipher suite that we preferred as the best option. Now, 10 years later, that's no longer the case, but there's no document that tells you which sensible combinations to use. So there's a bunch of cases these days where people end up you know, messing around with uh, OpenSSL configuration parameters that are almost unfathomable. Um, and it's trying to document the IETF part of that to do a bit better. That goes along with other, other things. There's a, there's a group called bettercrypto.org who are trying to do the, um, for particular things you would configure, here's a cut and paste um, config snippet that you can take into yours um, to get, hopefully, what's commensurate with what we're recommending in the ITF. So that work is on ongoing. Um, we also do documented a, what we, a best current practice, the BCP, um, after a major kind of debate in the, during the IETF last call. It was like hundreds of, me of messages. And essentially, this document, which should be an RFC uh, very shortly now, says it's an attack that the IETF should mitigate. And it takes two pages to say that, because there's a few caveats that you need to make and some uh, text you need to set up. But basically, it says that ITF working groups doing their work should consider this, this attack and should, have cons having considered it, should decide what to do. It doesn't say you must encrypt everything, because that would be too broad, broad, uh, broad, broad brush. Um, but it says you need to, to, to seriously consider it, you need to do stuff, and, and that's a valid question to ask and a target that ITF work now has for, across all work. Um, we had a couple of boffs at, in, at, in London which were interesting and are progressing towards becoming working groups. Uh, one of which was on DNS privacy. 
The issue here is that uh, for some uses of DNS, there may be, in fact be personally identifying information in a name, or it may be information that uh, you, you don't leak out. So you're accessing the website of some polit political party. There's a DNS query that may have identified that partic particular party goes out in clear, and we can see that some of these things are being monitored. Um, so it would have been unthinkable, I think, for DNS people to think about privacy as a feature two years ago. Uh, but we had a boff on it. There's, there are some people who are interested in working on it. It's not clear if we have a tractable way of getting useful privacy for DNS queries uh, that will scale and so on and so on. But people are looking at and examining the problem now seriously. And I think it's possible, at least, that we might find a solution that's somewhat tractable um, you know, up, to, up you know, to the re recursive resolver, and perhaps you need a different solution to the authoritative name server and so on. But the, the issue is being looked at. There's a mailing list. Um, a working group may be chartered um, if, if that goes well. We're also looking at encryption at the TCP there. So this is encryption as, as some extension to TCP. Um, and I have to, you know, I have to say, uh, I, I'm, I'm partly at fault. This was a, there was a proposal brought to the ITF a couple of years ago for doing this. My reaction at that point was, we have TLS. We don't want two of these things. And I was wrong. I mean, and, and a bunch of other people reacted the same and were equally wrong. Um, so I think it is a good idea, because there are applications where you, would, you can't turn on TLS for various reasons, or because there are cases where you might want to have the, the, a similar kind of protection that you get to TLS in the kernel. And also, TCP crypt is one proposal. Um, I think TCP uh, Inc. is the current name for the, the, the activity. Um, also, it, this can be done, in a, it is proposed to be done in a much more opportunistic security manner. In other words, just being able to set up some security, and if it works great, if it doesn't, you don't get it. But it, you don't fail the connection is one of the proposals. So work is ongoing at uh, this. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in this, ask me or, or um, yeah, go down the mailing list as, as you can do. Another thing we're doing um, is we're, we have set up, we're starting to set up a team of folks to go and look through old RFCs um, for, to do an analysis of what privacy or pervasive monitoring related issues might exist in those old, old RFCs. And we could do with some help there. I think this community would, would be well placed to kind of provide some of that help. Because uh, one of the issues with some of those old, old RFCs is not so much that the, the RFC is, is crap and broken and wrong. It's that the deployment infrastructure has changed utterly since the thing was written. Um, and I think that's why this community would have some really good input on that. And if, if there are people who are willing to spend a bit of time, go pick out an old RFC that you're interested in, write up a, a, some kind of analysis to say, here's the issues I, I think in today's deployments of this that may be worth addressing if we come back to work on this technical topic later on. That would be really useful. And I, um, again, if you're interested in that, mail me. I'll, I'll point you at the right things. Or just go do it. Um, you, by searching, you can find it. Other kind of things that are relevant in the ITF, I think um, there's more, but I'm just pulling out some. TLS, uh, we're developing a version 1.3. That's aiming at uh, improving performance. Uh, I think it will also aim at do, doing much more of encryption of the handshake, uh, learning from a whole bunch of issues that we've seen with TLS, because it's, as it's been a, a very widely deployed protocol. Um, it turns out that you know, that's not necessarily as trivial as it seems. There are tricky issues. Um, for example, the server name indication um, extension encryption, that's often used as a way of routing TLS sessions in things like data centers. So it's not trivial to say you can just encrypt everything. We, we have people in, in that working group who are analyzing that problem and seeing what we can do about it. The HTTP BIS working group is developing HTTP version 2.0 2 based on Speedy, I guess. Um, and the major deployment model for this seems to be to run much, much more traffic over, over TLS, either using HTTPS, but they're also discussing being able to route HTTP URIs over TLS without having the S on the URI. Uh, and I, I think if, they, if, they get to a, if that working group gets to a solution for that, uh, I think that, that could be really promising, because we have had an issue with getting uh, deployment of HTTPS broad enough. Um, you see figures like 30% of sites have some H support for HTTPS. And to get from 30 to 100% of, of encrypted traffic is a major goal. This, this, this technique of being able to encrypt HTTP traffic without anybody knowing it was ever encrypted, really, could be quite useful when we consider pervasive monitoring, and also for other reasons. Um, and of course, this is all ITF stuff. So Jump on in. You're you're more than welcome. Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons a bunch of us are here. I guess is to try and you know uh, help with that process. Um, so you know, join the mailing list, get involved, make your arguments, have fights with people, do all the usual stuff. So what do we do? What you know, what do we do outside the IETF or more broadly? So turn on crypto. If you've got applications, data centers, use current tools. Uh, you know, IPsec might be the easiest thing in the universe to use, but it's it can be it can fill a gap. IEEE MaxSec. 
DNS security is, is, is a good thing to have on for various reasons. Watch out for the future tools. Think how you might use them. So I mentioned DNS privacy. I mentioned the TCP encrypt proposal that might go somewhere. We also have a you know, far, far earlier t uh, days proposal on doing encryption of MPLS traffic, um, which again may find a niche that it fills, and we'll see how that goes. Um, turning on the crypto is something the IETF is used to discussing and has a bunch of people that we can. We also have the IETF, and I think more broadly, um, we need to learn more about things like data minimization because a lot of the traffic that we're sending, um, encrypted or not encrypted, basically is too identifying for not good enough reasons. So I think we need to figure that out. Now, it turns out that you can't obviously just make everything anonymous. I, I don't think that should be a proper goal. Um, but a lot of the time in protocols, we're too easy. We, we, we add a new use case and say, I'd love to know who the, request, who the very original requester was, and I might add some identifying information for that. And we're not necessarily thinking enough about the, the properties of that piece of data, how often it should be changing, is it managed, is it random, and so on. Um, and so, for example, in DNS, the queue name uh, is, uh, of a query is sent all the way to the root. So if I ask for www.example.com, and if that query does get up to the root, so does the full uh, DNS name I asked for in the queue name. Um, and so as part of the DNS privacy work, some people have said, OK, maybe there's stuff we can do about this. And there probably is it may have some side effects because maybe some people depend on this. So we need to figure that out and do the engineering work to, to figure out what happens. But data minimization and dealing with traffic analysis in general is something where we, we I think, generally need to learn more about how to do it. We need better implementations. I think Heartbleed is a, is a good example of that. And, and Heartbleed, has, um, Heartbleed is not related to the uh, um, pervasive monitoring issue at, at all, but is a good example of why we need better implementations. Uh, and, and so, for example, Cryptech.is is one I know a bunch of people who are working on to try and develop an open source hardware crypto based on a, a, probably an FPGA. Um, it's very early days again, but it's th that approach of trying to develop audited better tools um, and maybe open source hardware has a, a role to play and I think should be helped and, and pushed on. There's a whole, there seems to be like five or six people going down this road and hopefully one of them will succeed. We should be updating, auditing our crypto support and, and, and tools and so on. In deployments, we should turn on stuff that helps privacy. Right? It's not just in defining or implementing protocols. In deployments, we should do that. Now, it may have impacts on business models. That is true. There are some business models that people use that do depend upon doing things that are just not privacy friendly. We've all survived like multiple changes in business models. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that just because a particular business model um, depends on doing privacy unfriendly things means that it's unchangeable. If you actually think about these things, you may find that, oh, if I do this, there's another business model or a variation of what I've been doing, and I can make some more money. Um, and that's, that's a finding. You know? So we change business models all the time in this industry. I don't think we should be scared of that. Um, and for users, target diversity is, is, a, is a benefit. right? So we should be doing it ourselves. We should be using and encouraging people to use different services and not put all the, all the eggs in one basket. Because uh, if you do, you are just making the whole, you're, you're essentially creating a target for things like the signals and intelligence agencies to try and corrupt to try and co coerce, to try and collude with. And again, at a higher level, we should be discussing the issue openly. Some of the initial, I think that's, this is something that's, that seems to be getting better. In some of the initial, um, after some of the initial revelations last year, I got a, a couple of emails from people saying, yeah, sure, I'd love to help work on this. And then a week or two later saying, no, but I can't. I'm afraid, essentially. There were a couple of people said that. I think that's happening less now. Um, but I don't think we should be afraid to discuss this openly. We should be discussing it as a technical matter. There are technical reasons why doing this is bad and why we have to mitigate it. Things like the zero-day attacks, things like the fact that it's indistinguishable from other attacks. We know that if, if somebody can do X today, then it'll be done by lots of other people later. Uh, so we know we have good technical reasons to mitigate this. So we should be discussing it openly in relevant fora like this. And I think it's a fine thing that you're uh, doing it here. If you're the type of person who likes to agitate, then go agitate. Um, but I think what the main thing is we should be responsible, kind of engineers or computer scientists. I, this is a slide I use with my students. And, and take the broader implications of your work into account, right? So if you're working on developing some new feature for a router or some new um, way of, of using DNS for some CDN or whatever, we should be considering these issues, right? Because they are real issues and they impact on, on the broader internet and not just on next, you know, how, how quickly I can get this delivery out the door or how make this particular customer request go away. So in conclusion, I think the ITF has a consensus of the limited part of this talk that I talked about, uh, that pervasive monitoring is a technical attack and we're working on that problem. 
aside and more broadly from that, we all should consider how to, how to make this harder, how to make it so that it's less likely to happen. Um, because we know that people not doing this, the people who fall for that guilt by association fallacy, they're not going to stop, they're not going to suddenly realize, oh, that was a fallacy, I should never have done this. It'll keep going on and we, should, we need to work on, on how we make it harder. And then basically, when and if societies do eventually get around to the point where they say, oh yeah, it is a bad thing to do, we really should have the tools available and usable and deployable and implemented and so on, so that that, that societal decision could actually be impacted. That's it, thank you. Thank you. ¿Alguna, ¿Alguna consulta, algún comentario? Bueno. Ah, Carlos, oh, Carlos, I have kind of one. <laughs> thank, um, you, thank you for doing it in English. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the current model of PKIs? Is this, is this sustainable? Is it a good model to, to try to fix? Or should we basically trash it and look for another way of distributing public keys? Uh, so, uh, you know, I think the current, so the public infrastructure that we have today, I guess you're referring basically to the web public infrastructure. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think there are issues with that. Um, and I, no, I don't think we can throw it away um, because it, it actually is useful and does stuff, it's, but it's not perfect. Uh, I think there are various ways being worked on to try and improve that within the web PKI, the XLV9 based web PKI c uh, community. Um, so, for example, things like certificate transparency, um, is one thing that we're working on it with, with Google and other folks in the ITF, we have a working group on that now. So that's basically a way to have a log where you can deposit the public keys so that people can audit that bad things have not been happening. Um, you could quite justifiably say that that's a kind of a bolt-on because we didn't have some of the features we, that we, we did need when we got to that scale. And that's a valid criticism, there are good criticisms to make, but no, I don't think we can throw it away. And I think we can put in place things like certificate transparency to fix that or, or to mitigate and improve things. In parallel, we're also, we have a thing called Dane, which is a way of storing public keys in the DNS. Um, Dane, I think, is a fine technology. It does have some real uses today, particularly in that encrypting mail between MTAs. Um, it depends on DNS security, so it needs uh, it to be more broadly applicable. Either we have to get DNSSEC deployed, uh, which hopefully we will, people are working on, uh, or we have to figure out when it would be okay to not do that. Um, and Dane doesn't currently say that. But Dane is there as a DNS-based way of doing the same thing. Um, and I think basically we'd have to see how that fits into other protocols and how those get deployed. And I have another one if no one wants to say anything. <laughs> All right. I was curious, and there is a slide where you mentioned what things we can actually do today, and you don't mention routing security, you do mention DNSSEC, you mention IPSEC, but you don't make any mention to routing security. Uh, Curious whether you don't feel it's needed or whether you no, just, um, it's not there for reasons it, of space. Not quite reasons of space. I, I guess reasons of activity. I haven't. I, I, there have some people have mentioned the, the possible intersection between routing security and pervasive monitoring, but I'm not aware that that's gone beyond. Oh, we should think about this. People are thinking about routing security, but uh, in this context, I don't think that it's been thought through, and I don't. There's there's not an activity. If you would like to start one, I'd, I'd be really interested to talk about that. Okay, excellent. Okay. Bueno, muchas gracias. Okay, thank you. Thank you.